thanks a lot for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. And my talk's first semester, normally scan beyond normal, what to do with um, the findings that you s experience or that you see in the first semester. Well, let me start from another point. Well, we talk about CFDNA screening today and um, the first semester combined has been challenged by um, um, CFDNA screening. And if you only focus on trisomy 21, I think the story is, um, is, is told. Detection rates for trisomy 21 is much better with CFDNA screening compared to um, the combined test. And for several obstetricians and prenatal medicine um, experts, CFDNA screening is something like the holy grail. Yeah? You've got that tool that identifies all kinds of problems and you just need to take uh, one blood sample and the whole story is gone. But I think this is a wrong belief because the common trisomies are just the tip of the iceberg. There are much m many more things and patients and obstetricians are not that aware well that there, there are many more problems like fetal defects, genetic syndromes, preeclampsia, IOGR, preterm delivery, gestational diabetes, and, and, and. And if you only focus on common trisomies and the NIPT, well, then we don't, um, um, we don't get it right. And that's why first semester um, screening is more than just a test for Downs. It is a test for screening for chromosomal abnormality based on ultrasound and based on CFDNA testing. It's a screening tool for preeclampsia and obviously it's a detailed anomaly scan. Okay, And we'll um, discuss it in a sec, but you can pick up about half of the major defects in the first semester by having or by um, a detailed look at the baby. And let's focus on the problems from another point of view. Let's focus on the, of the, on the prevalence of anomalies. And you see here um, at, the ra at the age of 35, the risk of um, trisomy 21, 18, 13 is about 0.4%. And similar is the risk for microdeletions, duplications, but fetal defects are much more important. The risk of a def fetal defect is 1 in 50, so 2%. The same is true for preeclampsia. IUGR is 5%. Preterm delivery 10%. So if we only focus on trisomy 21, we just don't get it right. We could actually compare the risk for trisomy 21 uh, or for common trisomies with, with directly with the risk of fetal defects and maternal age. And as I already said, the, the risk of fetal defects is about 1 in 50, and the risk of a com one of common trisomy independent from maternal age is 1 in five, um, 500, and for trisomy 18 and 13, it's roughly 1 in 5,000. So if we now compare these two risks, let me see if you can see my mouse here. If we now compare the risks, by maternal age, it's only after the age of 45 where the risk of Downs is higher than the risk for common uh, for major defect. And that's why we should focus much more on a first semester anomaly scan. And we take the NIPT test for screening for Downs, but major defects are more important. And you can identify a lot of defects in the first semester. And just let me show you one or two small videos here by anomaly scan. You focus on, we'll start with the head, you can see both half the brain, you can see the skull, you can see both eyes, and I need to hurry up by speaking because you can see so many things at the same time. We've seen the face was excluded. Um, I'll go back once again because <laughs> I can't talk so fastly. But I started with the brain here, with two half the brain, excluded um, um, holoprost encephaly. I saw the eyes, the mouth. I can see the full chamber view, the left and the right ventricular outflow tract. I can see the stomach here below the heart. I can see the um, insertion of the umbilical cord, the, um, the bladder, the legs. Here, one side diaphragmatic, the diaphragm on one side. On the other side, the kidneys, a bit of the spine. The bladder was seen already. Hand on one side and the hand on the other side. And if you focus now on the heart, and by the use of color Doppler, you've got images that are close to the second trimester. And you can see that both half of the, both the left and the right heart looks normal. The outflow looks okay from the aortic and the pulmonary artery. And by the use of um, pulse Doppler waves, again, got so many tools to identify cardiac defects. So um, this is a one 
in 30 seconds you cover all kind of major defects or at least half the major defects. And don't forget the assessment of the nuclear translucency because nowadays again it's been the nucleus challenged by saying well why do I need a nuclear I can do in an IPT. But there are so many more things that we can extract from the nuclear itself. And I'd like to highlight one paper here um, where um, Bardi et al. focused on the outcome of patients or fetuses with increased nuclear. And you can see a list of increased nuclears. It starts from the 95th centile up to a nuclear of more than 8 millimeters. And let's focus on that column first. So the risk of a chromosomal abnormality if the nuclear was increased was about 30%. And obviously it's well known that um, with increased nuclear the risk for a chromosomal abnormality goes up. That's easy. There is also a substantial risk of a um, microscopic anomaly, but this is not really dependent on the, um, the nuclear translucency itself. It's about 2%. Here with single gene disorders, yes, it's similar. There's a small increase with increased uh, nuclear translucency, and again, about 2%. But with structural abnormality, the risk is or it's more dependent on the nuclear, and you can see how the nuclear um, or the risk goes up with um, increased nuclear, and it gives us an about 10% risk of a structural abnormality if the nuclear is more than the 95th centile. But on top of it, there are many more information that's uh, that are in the, this image. It's not just the risk for Downs or the risk for structural abnormality, but you can focus on so many more things by just focusing or just getting that image of the, um, the fetal face or the fetal profile. You'll start here, and this has been highlighted in green, and you can identify the increased nuchal. Then you see the posterior fossa here. You go get a um, sign of spina bifida, you get a sign of um, Danny Walker malformation by an increased posterior fossa just by focusing here on the um, posterior fossa and this in the same image as you do the nuclear translucency thickness. Let's go to the forebrain and the cerebrum and you can identify a major cerebral abnormalities like um, X encephaly, like an encephaly seal, or like um, holobros encephaly or um, or um, a, a severe ventricular megaly, just by not getting the falcs correctly. And you can have a look to the face itself here. And you can see um, mid, um, mid facial hypoplasia, you can see an upset nasal bone, you can see clefts, like in here, cleft lip and palate, or retrognathia. And I'm not aware of any other image that contains so many information by just fa facing on one single image. And there are several meta-analyses that have highlighted the, um, the chance of or the detection rate of the first trimester anomaly scan. And this is one which is um, nicely or often cited from Karim. And let's focus on major defects. So low risk population, major defects. And you can see the detection rate of a an, an, uh, detailed first trimester anomaly scan is 46%. And if you focus on a high-risk population, for example, the ones with increased nuclear, well, then the detection rate goes up to 60%. And the same has been done for cardiac defects. And again, look to the low-risk population. Detection rate was 55%. And in the high-risk population, detection rate was 67%, just by detailed first trimester anomaly scan. But obviously, it's important to have a structured pro um, protocol. And again, this is another paper that I want to highlight. This is a paper from China where the authors um, had defined 14 well, um, defined 14 sections, and um, the sonographers had to follow these sections very, very um, um, clearly. And by doing so, and by um, examining uh, 53,000 normal fetuses and 1,500 fetuses with defects, they had a detection rate of 43%. Uh, so it's important really to have a clear structured protocol and that brings you to 43% detection rate or even higher. But let's focus on the anomalies. Let's go through those ones. Which are the ones that are really the, the n uh, shouldn't be missed defects in 22? Well, obviously, it's exomphal, uh, it's exencephaly or unencephaly. It's megacystis. It's holoprosencephaly. It's abdominal wall defects. 
it's body stalk anomaly and these are molar pregnancies. I think these defects should not be should not appear only in the second trimester. These are easy to be picked up in the in the first trimester and I think this is a, a mistake if they haven't been identified in the first trimester. But there are many more things I named than the can be seen defects like cardiac defects, these two ones here like a diaphragmatic hernia doesn't work all the time but you can pick them up if they are big enough. There are skeletal dysplasias, skeletal anomalies, there are spina bifida, spina bifida and there is a um, um, cleft lip and palate. But obviously these are rare anomalies and you can't build up a screening system based on these anomalies but you can really say that if the ones that I've shown you before, the must, there shouldn't be missed defects, these should be always be picked up. With the other ones, I agree that these are a bit more difficult, they're nice to be seen, they trigger a different management, but it's not that you can reliably identify them all the time. But if you find these anomalies, well, we need to be clear that this is not screening anymore. Okay, there is a substantial risk of another abnormality. There is a substantial risk of a genetic abnormality, and you should go through. An, and NIPT is not appropriate anymore. You don't do screening in this situation anymore. You have to clarify what's going on there. You have to identify the diagnosis, and that's why NIPT is certainly not appropriate here. And let me highlight this on four standard anomalies, okay? Like holoprosencephaly or exomphalus here, or like megacystis or increased nuchal, okay? So let's go through holoprosencephaly, for example. The prevalence is about 1 in 3,000, and obviously there, th there's a large proportion of chromosomal abnormalities in these cases, and the majority are trisomy 13 cases. But Again, 3.5% are other chromosomal abnormalities that could not be picked up or that cannot be picked up with NIPT. And let's go through abdominal wall defects with a prevalence of about 1 in 400, so much more common. Again, 5% are other chromosomal abnormalities. Okay? And with um, megacystis, about 20% are other chromosomal abnormalities. So if you just do NIPT in these cases, you just don't get it right. Okay? It needs a clear clarification and a clear clarification a diagnosis means invasive testing. And to previous times was always the, the risk of miscarriage that um, um, patients and doctors were worried. But with all the new meta-analysis there, it's very clear that the risk of CVS or anamnesentesis is more or less zero. We generally um, 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 counsel patients based on a risk of 0.1%. The big question is not whether one should do an invasive test or not. The big question is which genetic test is appropriate. And here things change rapidly. To in Germany, we still do cytogenetic analysis, but that is not appropriate. Uh, well, at the first glance, but then you need to carry on with the genetic analysis. For example, if you find an anomaly, you, need to um, you, you, you certainly need to discuss microarray analysis if the nucleus increased, if there's an anomaly, it gives you about 6% more um, genetic abnormalities. And if you've got more multiple anomalies, then there's a 10% risk of finding, or actually there are 10% more um, major um, chromosomal abnormalities. And nowadays we discuss whole exome sequencing, or even in some cases genome sequencing, and that gives us 6 to 80% more genetic anomalies. So it's not the question of whether an invasive test is necessary, the question is which genetic test is appropriate in these situations. But let's go to back to the first trimester. What to do with increased nuchal, for example? Well, this is a nice paper from Israel, it's already five years old, but w there they look to the to cases with isolated NT and the chances of finding an, a copy number variant if the nucleus increased. And you can see, the, let's say, the base um, population here with a normal nucle of less than 3 millimeters, the risk of a pathogenic CNV was 1.7%. But it increased rapidly if the nucleus was above 3, point, uh, um, 3 millimeters and even more to if, the risk, uh, if the nucleus was 3.5 millimeters or more. So with other words, is it is not appropriate not to do a microarray analysis if the nucleus increased, even in cases if there's um, with isolated increased NT. But as we mentioned already, we discuss um, um, exome analysis today, and um, array is more or less a step in between. 
And there's a recent paper here from Melis from this year where they look to the results of exome analyses in cases with increased NT. And on the first glance, it looks as if it's a good thing to do, to do an exome analysis if the nucleus increased, because there, was, there were 10% um, of abnormal cases after having done a normal cytogenetic and a normal mi uh, microarray ana analysis. But if you go a bit more into details, well, in those ones with an isolated increase in T, which is the one here, it's maybe a bit too small, but you can see that there are only two diagnostic variants in the whole population, and two um, of the 111 cases means 1.8%. So, with other words, if the nucleus increased, but if there are no other defects, well, then it doesn't seem to be a good thing to do to go directly into exome analysis. Microarray analysis is appropriate, but an exome analysis doesn't seem to be appropriate. And we can also compare um, the, the, um, the usefulness of um, the um, exome analysis in this recent paper, which comes from this year, where they look to the pooled estimated diagnostic yield in cases with um, um, different anomalies. Okay? And if you have a skeletal anomaly, for example, the exome analysis identifies 53% of, or gives you 53% more detection rate, but if you go to increased NT and isolated increased NT, it's exactly these 2%. So from this perspective, it doesn't make too much sense to go for um, exome analysis if the nucleus increased itself. So with all these different aspects, what shall we do? We've got the nuclear, we've got the combined testing, we've got, oops, sorry, we've got, um, we've got NIPT, or we could even do an amnio in everyone, isn't it? That would be a, a completely different approach, and it was discussed some years ago, whether, why don't we do an amnio in everyone and then see what we get if the risk of miscarriage is so low, it's more or less zero, 0.1%, why don't you do an amnio in everyone and carry on from there? Well, obviously patients don't want this and we decided not to go along this way and then IPT is so much com more comfortable. But still we need to ask ourselves, how do we combine these different tests? Well, and I think the most appropriate way of dealing with it is to do an ultrasound examination first. And it's a detailed ultrasound examination that looks for anomalies and it's not just a CRL measurement. It's a detailed ultrasound examination that measures the nuclear transducency that identifies, that's made to identify about half the major problems. And if there is a defect, or if the nuclear transducency is increased of more than three millimeters, it doesn't make, to match, um, it doesn't make any sense to carry on with screening. Then it's time for invasive testing, and as we discussed it bef um, before, it's the question of which genetic test is appropriate. But if the nucleus is completely normal, and if the risk, if there are no, if the nucle um, and if there are no major defects, well, then just have a reassurance test, an NIPT for reassurance, and then you can deal with the results much easier. And you know, this is the completely the opposite way of how the um, um, it's been done in the UK, where they do the NIPT in high risk cases. But as we discussed it before, it's just a minute fraction that's been covered with, with NIPT in a situation where the risk for a major chromosomal abnormality is so much higher if there is an anomaly or if the nucleus increased. But obviously, doing an, a um, a um, CFDNA test in more or less everyone who's normal is also very much ex very expensive. So maybe from a um, from a um, financial point of view, it would be easier to go f through such an, a, a contingent model where you do a combined test first, and if the test is uh, abnormal, if the risk is very much increased, go for invasive testing because maybe it's Pub A is extremely low or the nucleus very high. And if the risk is extremely low, the prevalence of trisomy 21 is, is very low in this population. So it doesn't make too much sense to do further tests. But if you're in between, maybe carry on with NIPT. That's where to previous times the nose bone was assessed, and the ductus venosus and the tricuspid was examined. So maybe these things are not necessary anymore. And we've just um, reviewed our data um, where we've done a 
CFDNA test and combined testing in all patients. And we had 2,250 um, normal pregnancies and 163 um, babies with Downs. And there it's and the analysis has been done on real data. It's not a model where we had combined testing and CFDNA testing. And you can see if we follow such a, a protocol where a high risk result goes into invasive testing and a high risk result is defined as a risk of one in 10 or higher, or the low risk cases where we don't do anything anymore in with risk of one in a thousand or less. And in between you go for invasive te uh, for CFDNA testing. And if the CFDNA test remains unconclusive, we go for invasive testing. And by doing so, we got a detection rate of 98.5% for a false positive rate of 0.7%. With other words, this is more or less as good as doing CFDNA tests for everyone. And at the same time, you only do CFDNA testing for 25% of the population. So that's a reasonable way of dealing with this and combining these different tests all together. And well, this is finally my the end of my discussion and I have kept in time. I was a bit faster, but I wanted to give you some more minutes for discussion and I thank you for, um, yes, I thank you and I want, I'm looking forward for your questions. Mm -hmm.